Yeah, uh, Josh Weiss with Lutz. Um, I specialize in our um, audit and then also our business valuation group. We do, we've got about 150 people at our firm valuation. We've got six dedicated people and then a couple others that help out on staff. Um, the goal of my presentation today is to give kind of some fundamentals of, of business valuation. It's going to be a pretty high level review. Um, business valuation takes on all different forms. You know, valuations for a startup company is obviously quite a bit different than an established company. So we'll run through um, some fundamental theory. As you have questions, ask them. This can kind of take any direction that you want it to take. If I'm not covering what you want me to, ask me questions. And if I don't know the answers to those, then I'll defer and make Scott answer them, even if he doesn't know. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. I like to open with this joke because I think it's pretty important to ask the right questions in valuation because you can get answers on two different ends of the spectrum. You know, you might ask somebody, hey, what's my business worth? And they'll give you a number and then somebody else will tell you it's something totally different if you don't do it right. So it's kind of blurry, but he says, so the guy's going to the mate mart and he's asking, you know, do you have any vices? No, ma'am, no vices. Well, any hobbies? Well, I like drinking and gambling. Okay, so depends on who you're asking and what you're doing. So that'll kind of be an overriding theme. Make sure that you're, you're doing your valuation for the right reason. If not, you're going to come up with a completely different answer, or you might come up with a different answer. So shape of the project. You know, what is the use of the valuation? Why do you need it? Is it estate planning? Are you trying to value your business to put it up for sale? Is it a, is it a transaction? Is it bank financing? Something like that. Um, several different reasons to do that. What standard applies? Fair market value, fair value, investment value, they're all different things. So you might come up with a different answer depending on what your, you know, the reason for your valuation is. And then what are the characteristics of the ownership? Are you gonna have a controlling interest or a non-controlling interest? Controlling interest is worth quite a bit more. So if I've got a 51% ownership, I can make decisions that, you know, a 49% owner can't make. I can change things. I can um, offer to sell the business, all sorts of different reasons. And then is the company viable? Is it a going concern? Do we have something that says this thing's going to perpetuate into the future? Is it going to last? You know, so what are some of the valuation settings? Estate and gift tax, mergers and acquisitions, marital dissolution, you know, we get involved with divorce cases from time to time. Litigation and ownership disputes, you know, it's not always marital, sometimes it's owners disputing why they, you know, what the value's worth and one's leaving. Buy-sell agreements, family limited partnerships, stock options, um, employee stock ownership plans, and then on occasion, financial reporting. We don't do a lot of financial reporting in our shop, we do it from an audit perspective. You know, we review other people's work to make sure that you know, their valuations are correct, but um, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Okay, so what are the standards of value? I touched on this a little bit before. Fair market value is the one that we generally um, rely upon. That's basically a hypothetical buyer and seller coming to the table to a, negotiate a price or figure out a price. There's no, um, everybody has reasonable knowledge of the facts they both know which side. Here's what the fair market value is. There's no um, synergistic value, other things that might come into play. Fair value, that's more of a financial reporting. You know, goodwill, you've got goodwill on your books. I'm going to come in and audit your books and make sure that your goodwill is reasonable. That's, that's, that's the standard we're going to adhere to there. Investment value, that probably comes into play a lot with, you know, startups. You know, in some of the other presentations, I know I was down here when Dan McMahon and, and Michael Weta did something on, you know, what does a venture capital firm look for and a, and a, what's, what's a term sheet look like and what are they looking for? Well, that's going to be investment value. They're going to they're want to make an investment in your company to get you to the next level and take you up to the next level. So they've got a strategic reason or investment reason to invest in your company. So that valuation might be drastically different than what the fair market value one, you know, would come out as if I did it. So fair market value, I kind of ran through this. It's, it's a hypothetical buyer and seller. <clears throat> no preconceived you know, knowledge. You have reasonable knowledge of all the facts, but you don't have a reason other than you, you want to acquire this company. You don't have a massive company that you're going to acquire and fold into your footprint, so you're going to pay a premium for that. This is, what does an arm's length transaction look like? What is this? So in a state and gift tax setting, we're going to transfer, you know, a share of the company from, you know, generation, generationally, from parent to children. 
So what is that fair market value? What is defendable to the IRS? What is the IRS going to say, okay, here's what the value is. We're going to adhere to this standard. This is what we want that to be. Again, that's different from investment value. So what happens is you've got to make sure that you're in the right context, because if you're not in the right context, you run the risk of being misvalued or having a misleading value to where, um, you know, based on the purpose. So what are the characteristics of value? We talked about this a little bit too. A controlling interest, that's basically 51%. Think of all the things that you can do if, you've got, if you're a majority owner. You can decide to sell the business, you can acquire assets, you don't need approval to make changes on things. So if you've got that controlling interest, that's inherently more valuable than non-control. So if you don't have that control, you need to make sure you've got a discount for, for a lack of control or you've factored in that lack of control into the cash flows. Um, when you're coming up with your value. Marketable versus non-marketable. A privately held company is inherently not marketable. You've got to take some sort of a discount or consideration for the fact that you can't turn that interest in that company into cash in, in, in three days. Three days is kind of the standard we go with, okay? If I own IBM, I can go to the market, I can call my broker and I can sell it and I can have cash for my shares in that company right away. If I've got a, you know, 35% interest in a privately held company. I've got to go out and find somebody to help me sell my business. I've probably got to hire an attorney to help um, sell my business and do it legally and get the transfer affected correctly. So there, there's a discount for the, that lack of marketability. I can't get cash for that right away. Maybe I can if somebody's really excited and they're, you know, they're standing out in front of the door with cash, but you know, that doesn't exactly happen all the time with a private, privately held interest. So you've got to consider that marketability. You know, premise of value. Again, that's a, another fundamental that you've got to consider when you're, when you're going through evaluation. Is this company a going concern? Is it viable for more than the next 12 months? In a startup setting, that's tough to say. When you don't have a lot of history, it's hard to say, okay, we're going to make the next 12 months because you might be looking for that investor to come in and help you to bridge that next 12 months. And if that happens, great. Then you are going to bridge that 12 months, but it's hard to say, you know, are you a going concern? Versus a liquidation basis, that's probably more for a, an established company, um, going out of business, filing a bank, you know, why are, why are you closing down? Um, we're gonna orderly liquidate the company, so what are the assets worth? So that'll dictate kind of the, the approach to value that I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, but going concern is, is, you're looking to see that the company is going to continue. An investor doesn't wanna invest in a company that's gonna shut down in 12 months. You gotta have a very good reason. You know, again, I go back to some of the other presentations that I've heard, and, and you, you gotta make a case for if you get this money or you know, if, you, if your company's worth this, prove that to me and show me how you're gonna be worth that for a long period of time, because an investor wants a return. They wanna figure out that they're gonna get their money back and then some. Okay, so this chart kinda illustrates those different levels of control. Different levels of control and marketability. So the least valuable company is probably a non-marketable minority value. Not probably, it is. Okay, so if I can't market my company and turn it into cash right away, and I've got a minority interest, if I only got 10%, so I can't affect the change, and I can't make decisions in the, you know, the cash flows of the company or the direction of the company, that's probably the lowest level. And then we work our way up to marketable minority. Okay, I've got something that I know I can sell, there's a market for it, I know I can move this stuff, but I still have a mar you know, minority interest, so I might not be able to affect that change. Financial control um, value would be the next step up. Now I've got control, I can say, okay, I'm gonna sell this company. I can move it, you know, there, there's, there's an ability to sell it. I've got, I've got a greater value in my company because I, I dictate when that happens. And then up to the top would be the strategic control value, which would be, um, there's a reason for me to buy that company. I'm going to change, thank you very much. I thought maybe I just couldn't see. Uh, that strategic control would be, um, let's say I own a, you know, a dairy and there's a pasture right next to mine and I can expand my operations into that pasture. So, um, but that, that's owned, owned by an LLC or something like that. So I, I really want that property and that LLC has got an interest. So I might pay them a huge premium for that ground because I want to expand my, my factory or something or, or I'm in the line of business of, of making boots and I want to make shoes and I can go buy somebody that you know makes shoes and they've got everything online I, I, I increase my footprint and the, the traction of my business right away if I can make this acquisition so I'm gonna pay them a premium I'll give you two times what 
fair market value might be or what I might tell you fair market value is because I want that folded in because I can go take, you know, I can take the verticals and, you know, streamline all that stuff quickly and, and move forward. So a lot of times on the venture capital and the startups, that's what you're looking at. You know, you're looking at that investment value. People are going to come and invest in your company because they want you to get to that next level. How do you get there? Well, you need their cash to do it. And you've got a business plan and you've got all, thing, all the things in order to do it. So you're going to be looking more at that level a lot of the times in, in that setting. But again, go back to what's it for, why are you doing it, all those sorts of things to get the right value. Okay, so how do we come up with this? There's, there's three different approaches that typically business valuators um, rely upon. The asset approach, which would be the cost basis, basically the adjusted book value of your equity. You know, maybe I have some equipment that's worth more or less than um, it's on my books for, but it's basically your equity value. A market approach where you go out to the market and you look for you know, companies that are similar to yours or enough similar to yours that you can say, okay, here's what they traded for, here's what they went for. Um, and compare yourselves there, or the income approach, which is, you know, capitalized cash flows or discounted future cash flows. You're looking at your cash flow stream. You're looking at what kind of money does this thing kick off and return to an investor. And you're going to capitalize those or, or discount those to figure out what the value of the company is. So the asset approach, again, business, it's not really cash flowing. Um, our firm, and I do a lot with construction companies. So I might have construction companies and if I, I'm capital intensive, so I've got a ton of backhoes and scrapers and loaders out in my yard. I cash flow, I make some money, I, I, you know, I service my debt, I do everything that I need to do and I take some money home every year, but I've got equipment that's worth way more than those cash flows are. That might make sense for an asset approach. You know, in, in that case, I'd get an appraisal on my equipment, that might be more than you know, the value of my cash flows. So that's, an op that, that, that's a possibility. Um, holding companies, investment companies. If I've got a portfolio of different companies, I might be on an asset-based approach because I want to know what those different companies are worth inside, but my entity is really only worth whatever everything else is worth. So I'm an asset-based approach rather than cash flow or some other approach. Market approach is, um, again, going and looking at different markets. <clears throat> you start with the public markets, publicly traded companies, they're valued every day, right? You got the stock market, you got different exchanges, somebody's buying and selling that, so there's transactions all the time. Even on thinly traded markets, at least there are transactions saying, here's what happens, here's how it's dictated, um, here's what the price is. So you can go to the market and you can compare. That's pretty difficult to do, to compare a small privately held company to a large public company. You know, not very many computer shops are IBM or, you know, web companies are, are Yahoo right away. But if there's enough similarities and there's ways to do it, there's, there's factors you can take out of it and compare to those, those public companies. Um, but and you look at the different multiples, you know, um, where price to earnings ratio is the one that you see most published in, you know, in the journal or, or in some of the publications. But again, you got to know what you're looking for. You got to know what you're comparing to. So it's a multiple of of what? EBITDA, is it price, uh, you know, to earnings? What is it? So you gotta be pretty careful for a, from a fair market value setting and even from a small privately held company to go to the markets and say, okay, we're similar enough to this company to say we should have the same multiple. A lot of times when we do that, we take a fundamental discount saying, well, you know, we're similar, but we're not that similar. We gotta take a little bit of a haircut off of that because we, you know, we couldn't turn it into cash that fast. Comparable transaction method, Again, sales of similar businesses. So maybe you find a handful of businesses that are very similar to you, not publicly traded, but you can get some information on you know, what they go for. You, know, you hear that all the time. There's rules that sound, well, my buddy down the street sold his computer company or his bike shop for you know, two, times, two times EBITDA or whatever the number is, right? And well, okay, why did he sell it for that? Do you have all the facts? The toughest thing in the comparable transactions method when you're looking at similar sales at privately held companies, you don't have all the facts. You don't know what his motivation was. You know, maybe he's got something going on where he had to sell it, or maybe the, you know, he's got some investment or strategic buyer coming in to buy it, kind of that dairy or the, the boot example that I gave earlier. Why did it go for that? You don't always have all the details of that. So it's tough to, to do that, but if you can find an, enough comparable transactions and, and find a marketplace and say, here's what companies just like mine or similar enough to mine trade for, that's what our 
you know, you, you can apply those multiple. You know, so here's some of the things that I've, I've just kind of discussed. You know, what's the motivation for the transaction? You know, why'd we do it? Um, it? It takes a lot of time to find enough of a population of privately held companies that are similar enough to ours to, to conclude that, a, you know, multiple should be applied to our value or to our company. So this, it, I'm gonna get into the income approach now and just the fundamental theory behind it is value today always equals the future cash flow discounted at the opportunity cost of capital. And kind of breaking that down, so what does that mean? The cost of capital is gonna be, you know, the return or the risk, you know, that you invest in that company. So A, I've gotta have the cash flows. I gotta define a benefit stream or, you know, money that's gonna be returned to an investor or somebody that's gonna buy into my company, okay? And then what is that opportunity cost of capital? If I can put my money somewhere else and know I'm gonna get a return of 10%, why should I invest in your company and get, you know, for the chance to get a 25% return, but the risk be that much higher because I know what the others are, are returning. So it's the opportunity cost of capital is what else could I do with my money? If I've got the money to invest, why should I put it in your company versus somebody else? Because you've got to assure me that those cash flows are going to be, going to be there later. So, you know, this is the income approach is the most commonly used. That's what we rely on the most, be, most because we're trying to establish what are the cash flows, what are, what's the economic benefit or the return to the, to the investor. Um, so that's what we use the most because A, we want to see a going concern. We want to see a company that's going to generate revenues. I mean, that, that's why you invest in a company. You don't invest in a company so that you can liquidate the equipment under the asset approach. The market approach is really very difficult to, to employ. It might, it might work, it might not, but a lot of times you've got to figure out, you've got to go study this company and figure out what the cash flows are and what's the likelihood that they can return those cash, cash flows to the investor. So that's, I, I keep returning, re, you know, referring to cash flow. That's, that's the mechanism. I mean, it could be net income, it could be EBITDA, but somehow you've got to define what that cash flow is. That, what's going to come back to the investor? That's what you're looking for. So that, that is your, you know, what do you expect? I'm gonna give you half a million bucks today. I'm expecting a, a return of X. Um, what's the likelihood that that's gonna happen? So solidify those, those cash flows or you know, that, that stream. Um, again, uh, back to one of those other presentations. A lot of times when you're a startup, you're, you're making your case. Here's why we think we can get there. If you invest in our company, here's why we think we can go from this level to this level and our company is gonna be worth that much more later. Well have a concrete plan. Tell me why you're gonna make that. It's, it's much easier from my perspective to take five years of history and say, okay, this company's done this, and they've continued to grow, and they've got these, you know, this steady level, level of cash flow. Okay, and then let me capitalize that or discount that going forward. Startups, you're, you know, you're at the inception. You're, you're just trying to establish those cash flows. You're trying to figure out what that's going to be. So you gotta, you gotta get a model or a projection, and you gotta be pretty concrete on Okay, I'm going to increase my customer base from 100 to 2,000, and what does that do, and what does that look like? So, so you've defined that benefit stream, so that you know a valuation person or somebody that's going to come and invest can can capitalize on that or discount that and figure out what that's really worth to them if they give you the money today. What's that going to kick back in the future? That risk and that return is really kind of in the discount rate. Okay. So just some of the, you know, the different types of returns. EBITDA, you hear that a lot. Earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Depreciation and amortization are non-cash charges. Taxes and interest, you know, that your tax situation depends on your entity and how, you know, how that's structured, all that kind of stuff. Interest, that, you know, you're only paying that if you got bank debt or, you know, funded, funded debt. You're not gonna pay that interest otherwise. So a lot of times you add that back because you, you know, if you've, acquired that debt now, you probably go to acquire it in the future so that can be part of your stream. So let's add that back and then, then factor that in later. EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, that just ignores the depreciation. A lot of times you don't have a lot of depreciation so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So figure out what that number is. On occasion, sales or gross revenue. You know, we're an accounting firm. Nobody wants our equipment. You know, we can buy computers anywhere. Nobody, it, it's in our people and it's in our revenues. If somebody's gonna come buy us they're gonna do it on our revenues. They wanna know that the revenues are gonna recur and make sure that, you know, if we're a $5 million company that they're gonna get $5 million out of the deal and then how they structure that underneath and how they pay their professionals and do that kind of stuff, 
that's up to them. But so a lot of times service firms, things like that, you'll see as you know, the multiple be on, on sales or revenue. So cost of capital, again, expected rate of return that the market requires to attract funds to a particular investment. Again, this is gonna be your discount rate and why would I invest in your company versus somebody else's? If I know I can get 10%, why would I give you money to try and get 25%? What's the risk there? What's my risk? The higher the risk, you know, the higher the discount. Cost of capital depends on the riskiness and the investment. You know, just if, if, if that cash flow return is not assured, the company's not worth as much today. If I know I can get the money, and I know I can park it there and get, get a return on it, that company's worth more to me today because I'm taking less risk. So, I mean, it's all about risk. You know, startup companies, there's a lot of risk. You don't have a history. You don't have this, um, this nice, long earnings history, paying out dividends, doing all these things so that an investor would be really inspired to, to come in. They're taking a chance. You're, they're, they're, they're taking a chance on your model and your expectation that you know, your customer base is going to change or you're going to reach this many more people. I mean, you look at some of the, you know, the, the big tech companies and you know, the, the Facebooks and some of these things that have taken off and, and not even just Facebook, but others, you, you look at that and it, you know, people are taking a chance. They don't have this great earnings history or this, this revenue model that shows that they're gonna make a ton of money. But there's a, there's a chance there, and the chance is so great, well, people are willing to put that money in. So it, it, it's all about risk. So what's your discount rate? Discount rate is um, basically what you're saying you want to have returned to you. Um, the higher the risk, the higher the rate, and the lower the value. Okay, so if I put a discount rate, so if I'm gonna take your cash flows, and I'm gonna discount those back to today on a, on a projection. So you're gonna make 100 grand a year, and you're telling me that's gonna happen. Well, what's the likelihood that that's gonna happen? That's your discount rate. That's what I'm discounting it back to today. That's, that's what I think that, that's how I'm gonna establish the value of my $100,000 investment today. What's the chance that I'm gonna get, get the returns I expect and you're gonna hit those levels and change your customer base and all those different things. So, common issues, established versus new business. If I've got a company that's performed and performed and performed, it's easier for me to plunk that money in knowing that I'm probably gonna to continue to get that return. And if that company's paid dividends or they've made distributions to the shareholders, well, I, I got a pretty good reasonable expectation that that's gonna continue. Um, labor market, capital structure, you know, capital structure is a big one because can I go get debt financing? Can I borrow from a bank? Am I bankable? Um, if I don't have a lot of equity right away, bank might not wanna give me, give me the money to, to expand or do things. So. I've got to look to outside investors and some of the things that you know, smaller companies have to do to get started, mezzanine financing, whatever it may be. But if I've got a capital structure where I can go to the bank and I know I can borrow at historically low rates from people like First National Bank, John Gross, you know, it's dirt cheap money, right? So if I can go get dirt cheap money to do something and expand and I don't need an outside investor again to come in, I don't have to change my capital structure if I'm bankable already. That dictates risk in the company quite a bit. Um, how can I acquire ad additional capital to go forward and, and change things and change the kind of, kind of the trajectory of my company? So how do I come up with that discount rate? In a fair market value setting, we rely on studies and, and published history quite a bit for you know, a risk-free rate, typical you know, 20-year treasury or something you know, tied to the government, you know, return three or 4%, might be even lower right now because, because of the way that money's been allocated to the world. Um, so what is the risk-free rate? What, what, what can I put my money in and be assured I'm gonna get back? Well, you're gonna get a couple of percent, right? Government's probably going to pay their money back. We're not Cyprus yet, um, those sorts of things. Um, and then we'd build it up from there. So we'd start there and then we'd add kind of an equity risk premium. What has history told us that you know these smaller companies ought to return or what's the greater risk? We'd fold that in. We, then we'd look at company specific Okay, what, is, what are the characteristics of your company? Do you have really seasoned people that have started a new company and they've, they've done this before, they've turned a company into something really big and, and sold it off or been, been really profitable for a long time? If you've got that, well, that, that's gonna help your, you know, the credibility and um, probably reduce some of that discount um, if you've got that. If you have really inexperienced management, there's risk there. If you've never done it and you've never tried it before, there's a risk there. So that, that, that's gonna be full, added on and you're, you're gonna build up a higher um, discount rate so you're gonna have less of a return. 
you know, so how do you do it? Um, the WAC weighted capital asset pricing model, that kind of dictates the buildup, that kind of shows, you know, that's one of the methods um, you can use. Duff and Phelps is a source where you can go and you can look at it. Ibbotson's is another one. Uh, we use Duff and Phelps quite a bit where they publish, you know, for different sizes of companies and different strata of, of businesses. Here's what those pre premiums and um, historically have been, and here's where they are today. Here's where things are, you know, look. So you, you rely on that quite a bit. But the art is in understanding the company. You got to go in and understand management. You got to understand the geography. You got to understand um, the potential for new products, all those sorts of things. And then, you, you know, I'm trying to value that and, and, and guess at what I think it can do. So there, yeah, there's some gray area in there. And you might value it completely differently than I do, but hopefully we come to kind of the same deal if we've both done our you know, due diligence and understanding. So a lot of times you know, you'll see some people come in that might want to invest in your company and they're going to do a ton of due diligence because they want to know what that risk is and they want to be able to try and quantify that and put that into some sort of a model. So the WAC is the weighted adjusted cost of capital um, or weighted average cost of capital, I'm sorry. So again, if I've got the bank financing and I can get that at 4%, I gotta factor that in. I know I can get money at 4%, but how much can I get? So how much do I need? How much do I need somebody to come in that I've gotta give a 25% return to versus 4% to the bank? So you gotta get the right discount rate. If you miss the discount rate or you apply it to the wrong benefit stream, your value could be completely out of whack and it's probably incorrect and you're not gonna get what you expect to have happen. Okay, so capitalization rate, you hear that quite a bit versus the discount rate. Well, the capitalization rate's basically the discount rate minus your expected growth. So if I decide that I've got a discount rate of 20% based on that buildup and looking at those different layers and the company specific attributes, what's my expected growth? Well, 5%, okay, so then I've got a 15% capitalization rate. Um, and one divided by that cap rate is, is the multiple and that's what I'm gonna apply to that cash flow stream. Okay, so we go back to the, whatever the economic benefit is, whatever the cash flow is, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna go through all those gyrations to decide that I've got a good model and here's what my expected cash flows are historically or into the future. And I'm gonna decide on, you know, one year going forward, here's what it looks like. I'm gonna apply this multiple to it. So that's gonna be my capitalization rate. And that's how I'm gonna define that multiple and that's, that's how I'm gonna inherently establish a value. Okay, so if I've got cash flows of $100,000 and I've got a 25% discount rate, 5% expected growth, so a 20% capitalization rate, you know, one divided by that cap rate is going to be a five multiple, okay? So that five times 100,000 is going to be $500,000 company right off the top. So that's, I mean, clearly that's rough math doing it in two seconds right here, but that's kind of the theory behind how you'd come up with that multiple. But again, if you, if you don't have the discount right or you don't have the expected future benefit, that cash flow, right? You could be all over the board. You know, public markets can dictate that a little bit too. Again, that's more of the market approach and finding the right, the right multiple to apply. Okay, so we talked earlier, I talked a little bit earlier about, you know, if I can control a business or not control a business. Um, that's a big, that's a big um, factor in determining what's this thing really worth. Um, I might come down and I do all these things and I get to a controlling value. You know, say that $500,000 that I just said was controlling value. That's what it's worth if I can control it and I can affect the change and do all those things. I gotta take a discount for the lack of control if I don't. If I'm valuing a 25% interest, I gotta take a little bit of a haircut because I can't get 500,000 for that if I don't have the ability to, to sell the company, buy assets, change the capital structure, do different things to it. So I've gotta take a bit of a discount. You know, so how do, I, how do I figure out what that discount is? Well, that's, you gotta hire the right person and hopefully they, they, they've done their research and said, okay, here's what lack of control should be. You know, here's the discount. And you might get 10, you might get 15, you might, you know, it, it really depends on your circumstances and that company's circumstances. But inherently, there's less value in a company or, you know, an ownership position that doesn't have the ability to control the business. You know, so then we talk a little bit about the discount for lack of marketability. I talked some before, if I can't take it to market and sell it, is it really worth 
whatever that cash flow stream times my multiple is? No, probably not. I've got to figure out how to turn that into cash. It's going to take me time to sell it. It's going to take me fees with accountants and attorneys and um, a business broker. I'm going to hire all these people and they're going to take a percentage. They're going to you know, charge me fees to help get this thing ready to sell. So what's that lack of marketability worth? And again, there's no perfect um, scenario. Every company is different. There's a lot of studies and there's a lot of research and there's tools that you can go rely upon to come up with that. You know, you put your specific, spe specific factors in and you, you figure out what that discount is. And maybe it's right, maybe it's not right. It, again, depends on the buyer and the seller and who's coming to the table. So we can do all this work, come down to a value, and we've, we've got to estimate a lack of marketability. So even on an on asset approach where, you know, we've said, here's what the assets are worth. The market's told us this, somebody's appraised my equipment, all that kind of stuff. It's still gonna take me time to sell it. I still gotta find a broker, I gotta auction it, I gotta do something to sell that. So it's gonna cost me five to 10% to do that, okay? You know, and then one other thing, a lot of times you'll see buy-sell agreements or things in place that are company specific that say, you know, I've got to first offer it to the company or first offer it to the other owners. I don't have a free market. I can't just walk in and say, I'm going to sell you my company today because there's something in a buy-sell agreement or an operating agreement or somewhere in my company that says I can't do that. So you've got to consider those things. But again, that's a company specific analysis and you've got to go through the, the due diligence to, to figure out if those things are in place. Okay, so just a little, a few more things about, you know, that might impact that discount. Does my company pay dividends? Um, if they do, they've got a history of doing that. Well, that's going to entice somebody to, to invest in my company. They're going to want that dividend return. That's, that's getting some money back. You know, people invest in companies because they want to make money on it. That's why they're doing it, right? If I don't, then my company's probably going to be worth a little bit less. Um, recent transactions. If there's a market, if something's happened, even internal sales give you some idea what it might be worth or, you know, the fact that a buy-sell agreement's in place might tell you that uh, the company's worth a little bit more or less because of what's, you've got some indication. If you've got no market, no transactions, it's, you know, that, that probably increases the, the marketability of the stock or the investment. That's kind of my slide deck and everything that I've run through, but I, I, I went fast. I felt like I went fast. Um, there's a lot to cover. Um, again, it applies differently to every, you know, everybody's different company or different situations. So um, happy to field some questions. Um, anything you might have? Okay. Yeah. So back to that economic benefit stream what's the what's the true cash flow of the company you know and a lot of that's controlling in nature we, we, we want to normalize the cash flows um, so what scott's referring to is if i own the company and i'm a controlling owner i might set my salary and i might set it at double what market is so if i was going to sell this to somebody could i fire myself and replace myself at half the cost well that's the true cash flow stream um, so there's things like that do I need to borrow from the bank? If I have a new investor that comes in and kicks money in, I probably don't need that bank debt, so I probably don't need to pay that interest. Are there things, you know, so dictating the, the stream of cash flows, I guess, is really what, what Scott's referring to there and, and getting to that right number. What are the, what are the nuggets in there? Maybe I, maybe I travel a lot and I run that all through my company. A lot of times you see small companies that use, you know, their company as their second checkbook and you'll put a bunch of stuff through there. So what we see a lot of times when we get into, you know, M&A deals or, comp you know, people that want to sell their company, we, we you know, we, we put lipstick on the pig a little bit and we need to get a history of doing that so that the, the thing's ready for picture day. You want it to have, you know, solid cash flows. Here's what it can really do versus when I'm putting everything that I should be doing personally through my business and driving those cash flows down. So how do you ferret that out? Well, you got to sit down and you got to really go through line by line and say, well, what, what's going through there? The one. That is a very interesting question. Um, how do you get around it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how you get around it. I mean, that's that's a 
financial statement standard that's basically saying you need to evaluate the fair value of your, your investment or your goodwill or your intangible assets or something that's on your, on your balance sheet. So you're, you're marking things to fair value. Okay, so how do you get around it? You have a valuation expert come in and say, okay, here's why this company is really worth more or less than the goodwill. You have an independent valuation, look at it, and you, you take care of some of these things that Scott just mentioned. Adjust the salaries, get all that kind of stuff right, and say, okay, well, I'm, I'm above and beyond that, that goodwill number or that intangible number. They, it, my company's worth more than that because we bought something, we've acquired it, we've got that sitting on our balance sheet, now we've adjusted things to fair value because we know that's what they're worth today. We've done this independent valuation. So I don't know if that answers your question on getting around it. I think the biggest thing you can do is, well, in, in theory, that's the company's job is to you know, value that correctly. Okay, so what have they done? Maybe they've engaged a third-party valuation expert to come and say, yeah, it's good or bad. If, we, if we've written it down, there's some reason from a fair value or gap reporting perspective that says it's worth less than that. But again, it's in the eyes of the investor and who's gonna buy in, who wants that company, who, who wants to make an investment there. They may see a reason for that to be way more. Um, we've got an example of one that we, we've been through a couple of times we wrote it down quite a bit. They've come back with a valuation. They've hit their projections. But you know, in their infancy stage, when you don't have that history, it's hard to say. So if you have somebody from a financial statement perspective write it down, again, standard of value, am I fair market or am I fair value or am I investment value? Investment value is probably totally different. So I mean, this company's relatively new. It's worth a lot more if they can hit those cash flow numbers and they can hit those things. So getting around an impairments tough because you're, you're kind of apples and oranges and that somebody's for your gap financial statements telling you it needs to be lower, but an outside investor might think it's worth way more. Yeah, in that case, we basically had two or three years, there were startups and there were two or three years in their history. We took internals and we were okay with internals in the first couple of years and in the third year, we made them go out and get their part valuation. You know, somebody besides us who was independent really put a value on that little number and it was quite a bit higher When I'm an auditor, I, I don't like the goodwill. I, I hate that stuff because I'm going to come in and audit your financial statements, and I've got to decide whether that's good or bad, and, you know, goodwill, or I need to write that down. I don't like it sitting there because, again, you're justifying something that's happened in the past, right? That, that's what we did at the old value. That's what it was when we bought that company, or that's what we bought it for, so it was worth that. Well, the company's probably changed a ton historically, so I don't want to worry about writing down goodwill and evaluating that all the time. You know, the old way was to put that on the books and then amortize it over time, over the life of the asset. I don't like that stuff because it's just hard to, to justify and I don't like my clients in the private sector to go incur the cost of a third party valuation when they don't need to. So it's, it's kind of a tough deal. Well, yeah, because you're going to be at a, again, you're at a gap financial statement versus an investment value. I mean, you're two different perspectives on, on what a company's worth and the, the valuation metrics and what happens there are two totally different things. So I'd, go ahead. You mentioned uh, one of the, uh, a component of the value of what was the human capital. And uh, let's say a technology company where someone really, it, it becomes apparent when they're trying to acquire you that they really are more interested in your human capital than your products and you have good cash flow and a successful business. How would you look at that if you decide that you might be interested in yourself? I think then you're looking at an evaluation of talent. Who comes with you? What do I get? 
you know, again, if, you know, similar situation. If someone requires us, which one of my, how many of my partners do you get to stay? What are the restrictions on them leaving? If they all have to stay, then there's a pretty good chance we're gonna to continue to generate the revenue that, that we did. If six of them leave and they take a bunch of business down the street, there's no way my accounting firm, are, you know, if, if the human capital's not there. So it's really an evaluation of the talent. Can you replace them, can you not? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, maybe to reverse that question, I've got a, how does key employee dependencies affect valuation of a business? Because I've got a, a business, it's, it's robot-based manufacturing, and it has one full-time employee, and it's only ever gonna need one full uh, one employee. Key dependency would be a big component of that company-specific risk. So if it's somebody that you can replace tomorrow, um, that risk is gonna be a lot lower. I'm not gonna add any premium to the risk that I calculate and value, and, you know, that I'm looking to value your business because I can station somebody in there to run the robots and just let them go. So you probably have almost negative company-specific premium. It's more of a discount. You're, take, you're lowering that discount or that risk factor because you've set it up, the structure's there without the human capital. So, I mean, you're probably worth more unless that one person has all the knowledge and has to do everything. Well, then it's the complete flip. Are there any pitfalls with the 409A valuation now that one would be worried about for future investment rounds? Yes, but that's probably beyond the scope of my expertise for today in this presentation, but, but yes. Um, I will, let's talk afterwards, if that's okay. Because I just, I don't know that I'm the best one to answer that question. I got a lot of people from 409A perspective that would be better at explaining. I would, see, I would say be as explicit as you can. Okay, what are the restrictions on the transfer? If there's something in there that says you've got to sell it back first or you know, here's what you've got to, here's how you want the valuation done. I'd be pretty explicit and lay out how it's done. A lot of times you, you see a buy-sell agreement that's pretty generic and it says, well, it's gonna be one times book value. Well, if the company's done a 180, you know, they're completely different than they were when you wrote that agreement. That's not really valuable, so I, I'd say, a, be explicit on how, how do you want it determined? You know, who's gonna do it? What's the standard of value? How, what are they gonna look at? You know, knowing that an investor might pay a lot more or less for that company, um, but then review it with your clients on a regular basis. Because I've got one right now that's it's pretty stale. They've got this old archaic one times book value, but it makes no sense for their company. I mean, they're a cash flow driven company. It's more of a service based deal. So that their old buy sell agreement that probably got them by when they were just getting started was great but now it's probably outdated and they need to revise that so just as explicit as possible is the best Pretty tough to pretty tough to argue with something that's happened and transactions that are there, but I think where you'd go there is you'd, you'd justify the case for the different multiple and the different valuation. Um, you'd have to employ somebody to really understand the facts, and you know somebody's put something in play. Again, reason for the valuation is going to be pretty key there. Uh, if your rounds of financing, if that's what you're looking at, that's pretty tough because you've got that huge gray area. What's his motivation? Why, why do you say eight? I mean, where'd that come from? Is that reasonable? Is that a fair market value? Um, can't ignore it altogether, but you can probably justify that 
you might be able to justify that the mechanics of the company, the future prospects, all those things that expected returns doesn't warrant eight million. It warrants two. Don't you have a value? You do. Well, clearly that'd be more of an investment value versus the fair market value. So you'd be looking at two different things. So yeah. Well, no, I would, I would say that, you, you know, you'd have to, again, standard of value is a good, good reason because if it's a private investor group that's going to come in, what's their expectation? You know, they're expecting to invest in your company and then probably get out of it in three to five years. They're expecting, you know, returns during that time. Um, but at the same time, they may have the, the capital to be able to put it in um, and let it sit there and expect the big exit and their payday on the exit. It really depends. Um, my advice would be to build your case as to, to why you know, you know, why, why you're certain that your cash flows or your, you know, your operations are going to do what they're going to do and figure that out. It'd be pretty tough to say without really understanding why they want to invest, all those different things. Um, but my advice would be to set it up and be concrete in your plans and have a good understanding of what you think your true honest potential is because you don't want to guess wrong. You don't want to tell them one thing and then come in half of that. That's, you know, that's not what they're interested in. And they'll do such due diligence that they'll, they'll see through it. Okay. That's it. I thank you for your time. Appreciate the opportunity.